And now it's the boys on the hill, 5,000 watts, Slim Jimmy, Fat Jeezy. What to do? Let's take one or take two or take three. Which one it is? It's two. Okay. Take two. Let's take two. You go with take two. Yeah, these take two. Just wait. Take two will be better than take one. Yeah, man. We just (laughs) wasted about 20 minutes though. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, All right, so what's going on, fellas? What are we what are we talking about tonight? If you didn't hear our first take, you would have known what we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I messed up, man. I didn't push record. My bad. Are you good, man? Well, nah, the producer doing... slipping. Huh? Sure. The, the producer slipping, man. Big time. I'm sitting up there and I was like, why is that button blue? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, is they, did they change something? <laughs> yeah. So as we as we said previously, the last 20 minutes, we're going to talk about uh, the <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about like the preseason predictions and how they played out um, for both the SWAC and the MEAC. Um, see if everybody was right, everybody was wrong. And then Ralph's gonna go on his little spiel about his uh upcoming interview with another uh Black College baseball recruit. Then we're gonna talk about some other stuff, and that's gonna be the show. Is that right, Ralph? No. Very much. Okay, okay, Very good, much. good. good. Yeah. Got it. Okay, <laughs> so I'm gonna bring in Jeezy again. So Jeezy, uh talk about your interview. You got scheduled for the people tomorrow with uh Jojo Smiley and his right, amazing so- biceps. We have JSU commit JoJo Smiley will be on his official visit with the boys at um, June 16th at 6 p.m. on our YouTube and Spotify channels. Um, this young man is from Lake Mineola, Florida, which is right outside of Orlando, that Claremont area. Um, he is a two-sport athlete, played wide receiver for the football team. Thank you for not bothering him, football team, and giving them to us. Thank you. <laughs> um smart young man um intelligent mature beyond his years um i picked up on three things about him from my interview and i even told him during the interview um he has a great work ethic i could pick that up from talking to him he's self-reflective and at the same time he really wants to succeed so he had this young man hey i can't wait to see him while we up on the hill barbecuing um, in Jackson, you know, screaming out JoJo to him here in center. You know, I can't wait to see him play. I'm ready to go to Jackson and see him. He gave him a lot of Bo Jackson vibes for that picture, man. And yeah, it's crazy man. that you mentioned it. He says people in his area kind of call him, like compare him to Bo Jackson. Like, mm-hmm. he, put it to you like this. The picture don't do justice on how big he is. <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and- yeah, but we're, yeah, yeah, we're excited to see JoJo play ball at JSU. Um, and we're excited for this series, the official visit. Uh, Ralphie did one last week, too, with Southern Commit uh, uh, KJ uh, White. A very good interview. You also check that out. Um, Jeezy asked some really good questions, really insightful questions. Um, Mr. White gave some really good answers. That kid got a really good head on his shoulders. He could be what he want to be, um, baseball player or what else. But yeah, like I'm really excited to like see this series as it develops throughout the summer. And we have Arrington Eason for next week, who is a Gremlin commit. So, coaches, I'll just let your commits know. I'm gonna be hitting them up on social media for for the interview because I feel like it's our job to get exposure for these young men coming into the league. You know, just reaching out to them because this is a brotherhood. You know, they may play at different schools, but we, we all are part of the HBCU baseball fraternity, you know. And like I say, the benefits of HBCU when it comes to the network that you have is amazing. I know it's off subject, but, you know, living here in Atlanta, I ain't worked for them but HBC. All my administrators, principals have been HBCU grads and a lot of my coworkers, so. I just think it's a it's a great situation, you know what I'm saying? And the young man hit on some things that I can relate to being an HBCU baseball player. 
and I'm pretty sure some other guys when he said about being on his visit that he felt comfortable being around those guys because he could they could relate to him and he could relate to them. So I think it's a good situation. So check that out tomorrow, people. Uh, we're going to keep bringing more exposure for the young men and the programs for HBCU baseball because that's the mission of this show. Whether it's two, three people watching or somebody gets exposure, that's all we're about. No no program shaming. We ain't trying to get no clout chasing, none of that. You know, it's just, just what we do. So mm-hmm. back to you, Slim. Thanks a lot, GZ. Um yeah, but uh, yeah, but would you being a former recruiter yourself for a college baseball team, like how important is it for coaches you think to connect with players like on a human level? I know like they're in the game to get these kids to get on the team and help them win games, but like how do you kind of like reach a kid when you're on a recruiting trail as, as a coach? Just be genuine. The easiest thing you do is be yourself, you know, let let the, the schools the things that for the school speak for itself and just be a a good person. That's all it really is because people know if you, if you're trying to play them or not, just be genuine, build a relationship like you would with anybody else and go from there. Like like both. Go ahead. It's no, it's really no magic to it because people can see through that. So be just be genuine in the process. And I'm the type of guy if you don't come to my school, I'm not going to be mad at it because you still have an opportunity. And at the end of the day, I want you to have an opportunity. So, you know, it's about building good relationships because you never know down the road what might not happen. Right. Yeah, both of you guys were recruited. I wasn't, I was a walk on. Um, so, when looking at schools, like what are some of the things y'all kind of took value in before making the decision to pick Jackson State or decide what school y'all was going to go to? That bottom line, that budget. Yeah, did they like did they have what I was interested in academically was something mm-hmm. I paid attention to? And also with baseball being the way it is with the scholarship, you look at the the financial part of it. Mm-hmm. What's the cost of tuition? How much is my scholarship? What do I have to pay? So, you know, and during that time, at least for myself, um, I had the GPA, but they didn't really push the 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 getting the high ACT score. It was like, hey, you need this, you need to make at least this with your GPA to get in school. And that's what I went into the ACT test thinking, like, oh, I gotta make at least this to get into school. And it was like, I'm just trying to clear the clearinghouse. It wasn't the mindset of nobody was around me saying, Hey, you need to go get this on the on the test. You get this with your GPA, now you get this money, and it was like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. But, you know, with my little brother, that little dude there, you know, he got a lot of money to go to school, so that's different. But, yeah. that. And then during, when, when we were coming through, if you got academic money, you couldn't get – you had to pick either one. If you got the academic scholarship or the baseball scholarship. Like, now you can stack them, so back then you could Them. Oh, I'm waiting for what's the answer because he was—he's a oh, recruit himself. Why not? Uh, the, outside the budget, I, not one thing I did look at is location, location, campus life, and stuff like that. Do I feel at home, or do I feel like out of place? You know, um, and of course, uh, you know, look at the team chemistry. You can feel the team chemistry on the first visit. <laughs> like Jojo said, man, do I fit around? Do I feel like these could be my brothers for the next four years? So you kind of got to have that 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 mindset of, of thinking ahead and knowing where you feel comfortable and if you at a place where you can be yourself and grow. And especially coming out of high school as a young man, you know, you, you don't know yourself, but you feel like you know everything. I know back in the day, I felt like I did, but still at the same time, I knew I had room to grow. But you just had to look at the program and see if, if if the coaches were genuine and if you felt like it was a, a good, you know, environment for you to grow. And on top of, you know, having, you know, the edu- the, the, the studies or have the academics that you want to go after the career that you want, just in case, you know, your plan A don't work out. 
You know, I mean, these days kids got a lot of options and you throw an NIL scenario into it as well. Like it only enhances their value. So I can be a little bit more choosy than before. Like when we was, you know, deciding whether or not to go to college at a certain school. So yeah, like these kids are like in a really strong position now to, to really like make decisions that can really impact their not only baseball careers, but like their academic careers and beyond very, very quickly um, when they decide what school to go to. Yeah, but looking forward to um, Ralph's uh, interviews uh, with these young athletes throughout the summer. I think the public is going to really like getting the insight on these kids and how they think and kind of like what they value. And more importantly, like why they picked a black college in the first place, because like we're kind of like in a renaissance right now um, where you see, you see it, especially in football, a lot of four star and five star kids are legitimately considering going to black schools now. And so like a spillover effect to baseball too. So over the next couple of years, we're gonna see a lot of really good quality, high level players all across the spectrum of black color sports. So this is a really good thing. Um, as we start to talk, start to talk this the show, we're gonna start off with uh looking back at some of the predictions from the MIAC and the SWAC, heading into the 2022 season and to see whether or not they were accurate or not. Um, so we're going to start in the SWAC first with the preseason predictions. Um, out East, uh, Jackson State coming off an undefeated 2021 uh, regular season. They lost in the SWAC championship game by one run uh, in extra innings. They were predicted to finish first in the East, followed by Alabama State, Florida A&M, Bethune-Cookman, the newcomers. And then Alabama AM in Valley. And out west, Southern was predicted to finish number one, followed by Gramlin State, Prairie View, Texas Southern, Pine Bluff, and Alcorn State. And fellas, um, out west, Southern won a division, but they had to win it in the last weekend of the season. Uh, Alabama State won the SWAC East. Um, so do you think overall, like it, it kind of played out? the way you guys expected it to, or were there any surprises you guys saw? Mm. I ain't going to go watch it. No, nah, go. Oh, well, I was just going to say, you know, uh, as far as the West, you know, um, it's, it pretty it pretty much uh, kind of played out the way it was predicted. Um, I saw a few uh, kind of changes. Uh, I think – the biggest team to me was Prairie View. They 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 kind of, uh, you know, I mean, it shows the depth of the SWAC because Prairie View was picked to finish fourth, and they end up, you know, uh, finishing uh, being close to finishing uh, the, in first place. And you know, that West went down to the last weekend, like you said, said Slim. Then as for the East, I mean, Alabama State. What can you say about them? It was only one leadership change as far as the conference once conference uh, play started, and I think that was probably like between FAMU and and Alabama State or Bethune and Alabama State. But uh, I think the the addition of FAMU and Bethune coming to the swag they do know, but just put us at a high level when you think about HBCU baseball. Um, it would be real interesting if we could bring in some of the MEAC teams and kind of throw on a, a, a tournament similar to the Celebration Bowl and just really have a, a HBCU classic, you know. But uh, when you think about HBCU baseball, uh, the swag is probably going to be top tier. You know, I wish we would probably get some some better rankings when, you know, our, our champion comes out for tournament play for the NCAA tournament because the conference is strong. Hopefully uh, – as the years progress, uh, outsiders get ready, uh, you know, see the same thing that we're seeing and, and probably can judge our baseball teams better than being, you know, the, the 168 best college baseball team in the nation. Right. Now, we end up finishing fourth in the East. I did not expect that at all. But, hey, things happen in baseball. Um, we came out of the gate a little slow. We had some guys – um, have some major injuries early in the year, but um, they battled back. At one point, we went last place in the East, and we still found a way to have um, not only a winning conference record, but also have a winning record on the season. Um, Alabama State was consistent, um, I think, except maybe the first two weeks of the year when Bethune may have been in the league. Mm -hmm. It was 
pretty much Alabama State. Fan may have had a spurt when they were in the lead in the East, but it pretty much was the Alabama State show in the East pretty much all year. And um, Alabama A&M and Valley, they had their moments, but and Valley really came out of the gate hot. You know, um, they um, the first time around they took um, Bethune to uh, – they split the first two games, took them to the third game to see who was going to win the series. Um, I think it was a similar situation in Jackson, but they were scrappy early. But once the season kind of wore out down, they kind of faded a little bit, and a And M did a little bit too. Um, as far as the West, um, the the top four finished as it was predicted in the regular season. Um, the crazy part of that is Southern was in fourth place with two weeks to go in the season. Prairie View was leading, you know, and. Um, Prairie View ended up losing five of their last six going into the tournament, and that put them in third place um, with due to the tiebreaker they had over Texas Southern. And, you know, Southern, I want to say, swept the last two weekends, and I think Graham and Mel lost a game or something, one game the last two weeks, and that that kind of shaped the weekend. Now, I'm going to say the Western Division, Alcorn never got going. I don't know what was going on over Alcorn. But they never seem to get going this year. Um, Arkansas Pine Bluff had their spurts. But um, like Watt said, the addition to um, the league with FAMU and Bethune, it it enhanced the baseball in the league. It enhanced the depth in the league. Um, and I also think it's going to eliminate that team or those teams that shouldn't be in the tournament, just being honest. True. Like that, that team that's fi- – uh, what – the crazy record they were having in a tournament, but because you need four teams from each side, it would be that team still. So I think, like you said, watch with them, um, with where they placed us as far as the NCAA tournament, I think that comes down to the perception of the conference. Mm-hmm. You know, and with the perception of the conference, um, that comes with how we compete out of conference. When we when we step up to play the G five teams, when we play the P five teams, you you gotta you gotta win those G five games, and you gotta win some of those P five games too, and you gotta be competitive. And also with the scheduling, I think you know not throwing shade at nobody, but I think we need all D one schedules from every team. Like if every team played a D one schedule, that situation with Alabama State doesn't happen. True in the tournament because the perception of the league has changed. Like, how how are you gonna sit here and tell me that a 35 win team that was 21 to 7 in their conference didn't lose? They were basically 20, 25 and 7 counting the tournament in conference. And you're gonna sit here and tell me that they was the 64th team in the tournament. I don't believe it, mm-hmm. but it all comes with perception. It, how we perceive, what are we doing when we play those bigger schools? How are we scheduling? Now, some would say, Ralph, you know, well, Alabama State, they, they lost their two games. They weren't close to any of them. So why are you complaining about the fate that Alabama State got, but what we're saying is like, you know, they're a really good baseball team. And so have them play the number one team in the country based on, I guess, regional seating or whatever, how the NCAA community kind of justified it was kind of wrong. Cause like looking at like the the regional and the super regional layout, you had UConn go all the way to California to play Stanford in the in, in the Stanford regional. Auburn went to Oregon State. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so the community isn't always beholden by like we got to put teams in a certain reason based on geography. Texas went to East Carolina, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, like, like we said, like Alabama State, like, got a really not not fair shake on that one. I mean, like, they they uh, being a third seed could have probably helped them too, um, in that reason. But that was a really tough reason that was in the beginning with. It really yeah. didn't matter like who the opponent was. They were playing like they were playing like a really high level team, no matter what. But like them, them a thirty five win team, like like Jeezy said, like being put in that position, 
right off the bat, did not do them any favors to try to win a game in that region. But we're kind of spilled milk. It happened. Um, but they had a really good season nonetheless. Like like you said, Ralph, like they pretty much went almost wire to wire in, in the swipe this season. So I'm pretty sure like next season they'll be right back in it again, along with Jackson State, some others. But I want to ask this question to y'all. Like with, with the depth of the league now as it stands with the with fam you and Bethune Cookman in the league. And we already talked about some of the high school kids coming in down the pipe the next couple of years. You think we're going to have a situation where the SWAC champion is going to alternate from year to year? Or like familiar phrases like Southern and Alabama State, that State continue to be dominant teams like they've always been? I think it's going to be – I think it's going to alternate, man. Yeah, I think it's going to alternate too. Like I really do. <clears throat> I really yeah. believe it's going to alternate because just because of the talent that's coming in. And then the transfer portal is going to start playing an effect into it too. We've already seen last year the the impact of Shamar Page in from the transfer portal. Shout out to Mr. Page who signed for the, with the Frontier League, yeah. with one of the major league partner um, major league partner leagues, independent leagues. So hopefully that he gets some innings to help his MLB draft stock. He also made all um, all region. Trey Page made all region. Jordan Hamburg was all region. No, Jordan Hamburg was all American. Mm-hmm. And also, I want to so say. So was Pays. Pays all American too. Yeah, and um, yeah, John, Gar- American. John Garcia was also all region. So those who I can name off the top of my head. So congratulations to those young men. They're being recognized not only on a, a regional level but also on a national level, baseball wise. And this includes all Division One, whether it's a G five or P five school, when it comes to the um, baseball. So it ain't just the the HBCU region and all American team. No, 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 no. They, these they boys legit. These awards ain't the ain't the um big fish in a little pond inside this, the HBCU bubble awards. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 no. These these are by the American Baseball Coaches Association in Rawlins. So these are legitimate mm-hmm. awards. This is. Mm-hmm. Like the coaches, you know, this is legit. This is as legit as it legit, you know, as it gets, you know what I'm saying, as far as being awarded. So congratulations to those young men. And if it's anybody that I omitted, it was not on purpose. It was because I have not seen anything with your name on it or my brain or I lost the thought with my hair. And, hey, man, I apologize. The same guy forgot to hit record. Don't believe him, man. He forgot about y'all. <laughs> yeah, but like you just make a really good point, man. Like to have those kids recognized by national baseball experts in the college game, at least, speaks volume to their talent and how close attention those folks pay to like not only them, but the league in which they played in. A lot of times the the swag and the MEAC and the bike college conferences get kind of downgraded for like receiving not have really good talent across the board, but like we can get like recognized nationally and, and people with a, like a really astute eye for the game can notice like it don't matter if this kid playing the swack or not, it's a really good baseball player. That's all that matters. So yeah, kudos to them for, for their postseason awards. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now we're gonna check the MIAC um uh, preseason uh predictions. The MIAC, as as many people know, have been reduced in number. But they're strong with four. Um, uh, the priest's order prediction for the MEAC was um, Norfolk State, Delaware State, Coppin State, and Maryland Eastern Shore. And the actual 2022 standings as it played out was Delaware State. They won a regular season championship. Uh, Coppin State, they won a uh, MEAC tournament. They finished second. Um, Maryland Eastern Shore finished third. And bringing up the rear was Norfolk State. Um, we didn't go throughout the season really in depth on the MIAC like we did the SWAC, but they do have some really good baseball there, despite the fact only having four teams. Yes. And, 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 and two of the best players in that, in that conference were um, Trey Pays for Delaware State. We talked a lot about um, Jordan Hamburg, the pitcher, uh, hitter for Coppin State. But um, Delaware State, to me, fellas, they were – I thought 
they were the best team going into it, and they actually ended up winning uh, the regular season championship. They actually fell short in the title game to Cobb State, but what, what what were the guys' impressions on the MEAC this season? I know, like, they only have four teams that I mentioned before, but, like, how do you think the league overall kind of kind of shook out for them? Just from what I did watch and pay attention to during the conference tournament, they play good baseball over there. They just don't have the same number of teams. Mm-hmm. And and it's also with them being like with um with them being the geographically. That's what I'm trying to say. Geographically, follow me. <laughs> um <laughs> I know we say we want the MEAC schools to join, but I just don't see how the G, the yeah. how, how that'll work. You know, right. you know, with with the location of Coppin being in Maryland, then you got Delaware State in Delaware. You know, then Norfolk in Virginia. It's that's that's some traveling, man. But as far as the baseball, I think it's some good baseball. Trey Page is a good player. You got C.J. Loper, who is the um, closer for Delaware State. I want to say he was a reliever of the year. Um, Hamburg's a great two-way player. You got uh, Marcos Castillo over there at Coppin State. Like, they're deep league, man. And then there's another young man, I want to say, just transferred from the College of Charleston um, to Delaware State. So I, they that league, from what I could tell statistically, is more of – it's more pitching dominated over there. Um, they didn't have some of the outrageous scores like you saw in the SWAC. Um, some of the the team ERAs were lower. The team batting averages were lower. They didn't score as many runs. Um, and that was even evident by if you were to compare the, the two players of the year from the two leagues between Trey Page and Corey King, um, outside of what I think the – Home runs and the bad average, like the RBIs, King might have almost close to 20 more RBIs than he did. And I just think that comes down to the, the pitching in the league. And then they didn't play as many games. Yeah. So, with them only having four teams because they played um, double uh, four game double headers. So, yeah. But, you know, I think it's a, a, a good situation. You know, you got James DeLoth over there at North, um, Norfolk State um, as a pitcher. So it's it's interesting to see how the league is going to play out moving forward. Um, how they're going to attract more teams? Um, are they going to bring some revive some of the baseball programs in the school? Mm-hmm. I don't know if they they had to reduce them, but because of um, just school funding in the COVID year, or if it was Title IX or whatever it was. But hopefully they can bring those programs back because the young men deserve to have the opportunity to go to the um, NCAA tournament on an automatic bid. So yeah. I'm, I I don't know. I, they miss commission. I need you to figure it out. Yeah. She said they got the elite eight over there. They they ain't going nowhere. She said so. They can't be the elite eight when they down to the final four in baseball. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They can't be. But I, I definitely would like to see Howard come back with their baseball team and Morgan State. You know, and shoot. <clears throat> Yeah, Morgan State come back. That that's the Compton State's neighbor. That right there would be a heated rivalry. But you know, yeah, it'd be good to see more of the schools buy into the baseball and bring back their programs and be able to uh, to because the Miag is it, it's pretty close behind. Because you just got to think about family and Bethune. Just so many years ago, we just came from the Miag. And the Miag <laughs> used to be at that time. The Miag was stronger than the Swag in baseball. So, you know, it's just uh, if they could bring some interesting programs back and probably bring in one or two other schools, even if they just bring in a baseball program, uh, you know, so uh, it just, you know, help improve the the culture and, and, and me at baseball. Um, but I, I don't I don't see Coppin State or Delaware State falling off now at this point. You know, uh, I love to see the recruits that they have coming in uh next season but um uh, you know when you play high quality baseball in the center around pitching versus you know playing rounds on the on the board to try to cushion for the pitching that you may lack that's some good that's some good baseball right there now guys we follow the sport like really closely um especially at this level 
being in a four team league, like how does that either connect like help at all in terms of, I guess, playing competitive baseball, uh, creating a schedule um, where you got to force to like play more division one teams outside of your league or, or does it like kind of hurt because you only have four teams, you got limited opportunities to like really expand and see what your team is really made of over a long course of a season. Well, with it being so few teams in the league, you're going to have to be, you're going to have to schedule, you know, do some good scheduling, which midweek games mm-hmm. and exactly how you put them together. Because if you're playing four games on the weekend in a doubleheader, you're going to have to be a, be smart and not overload the midweek. Mm-hmm. You know, but still, you still need to play to see what your team is going to be. And, you know, you still got to play the games. You know, the you can't do anything about the conference schedule. So those games are already set in stone on your schedule. But you control the other games that are non-conference. So I think you should always have a combination of um, challenging games and also some games where you're supposed to win, but, you know, you still got to go out there and play the game. Some confidence builders and also some 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 ch- skill builders. Mm-hmm. Some adver- you know, where you got to go through, you may have to go through some adversity. It may be a one-run game. You're like, you need those type of games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was thinking like maybe like the MEAC could possibly recruit some associate members to expand yeah. their baseball conference because like with a four team league that that can't last very long, man. Like, so you, so you got to diversify your competition at, at some point. Yeah. So does. so what who what conference could they possibly could they join in that area to be an affiliate member, or what schools could they find to be a, affiliate members? That's a good question. I mean, like the uh, SICA, they had Ever Waters come over as associate member, but that's Division Two, and no Division Two team is going to jump to Division One to play in any league. But, um, but let me let me let me cut you off. Of this. Let me yeah, interject yeah. real quick, and then I'm gonna let you finish the tape. You got to remember, it was Edward Waters is moving up from NAIA to D two to the mm-hmm. SAIC. So. Those games they played against the um, SIAC schools, those were non-conference games. Those weren't conference games for for um, Edward Waters, nor the, um, the SIAC schools. Those were non-conference games. So next year, just think about it. With them joining the league next year in the SIAC, think about that's another weekend series. So now they, they getting another quality team added to the SIAC now. To go, to go with Savannah, to go with Albany, to go with Spring Hill, to go with Miles, you know what I'm saying, the Kentucky State. You know, you're getting a new head coach at Tuskegee, so you don't know what's going to happen there. You know, and I just sent y'all um, sent y'all a text on on, on some uh, some information I just received. Yeah, so uh, Mississippi Vice State um, uh, baseball coach, uh, Stanley Stubbs is stepping down. He cited health um, reasons for his um, departure. Um, so there's a big hole for Mississippi Valley State. Um, Stubbs was the uh, was hired to head coach at the end of the 2021 season, replacing Aaron Stevens. Um, Mississippi Valley State under Stubbs won 10 games. Um, it was the most games the baseball program had won since 2020. So yeah, a, a really big void. Um, the Delta Devils gonna have to fill this offseason at a team that was showing a little bit of promise under Stubbs. So yeah, like just another opening at that school. We'll see how that plays out. But yeah, like um, a, a really big blow for their program. Mm-hmm. Right. So yeah. hope Coach Stubbs. That was, hope everything works out for Coach. I hope it does too. Yeah. But yeah, but. Well, Ralph, I was just sitting here looking at the map to go back to your question of associate schools that could probably join the MEAC. I mean, because of the location, it's pretty scarce. But, I mean, of course, you could look at the University of uh, District of Columbia, UDC. I didn't know that was HBCU, but they could probably come in. 
Who else is in that territory? Uh, you got Lincoln University. This is Pennsylvania. But it's it's almost like scraping the bottom of the pan, trying to trying to find somebody else to fill in for you. I that's mean, what, it's true. That's what I'm saying. They're in a tight spot. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and then the one thing that I know for sure, every every year they have to apply for the automatic bid. So now let's look at it in in this sense. Mm-hmm. Let's say hypothetically, and I want to say, Slim, did you act? Did you say this? You, I was having a conversation with somebody about about this um, fact that the MIAC was losing the automatic bid, and they asked me, did I think if the SWAT could be a two bid conference hmm. moving forward? I was very honest, and I said, no, that's probably gonna go to a P five school. If yeah, that's right. yeah. Like that, 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 yeah. that automatic bid now is going to turn into an at-large bid. Mm-hmm. So if you think the SEC has four teams now in the College World Series, or they if they had 12 teams in the, the tournament period, now all that's going to do is just give justification now for another P5 school to get in the tournament. And mm-hmm. potentially, if the MEAC does get the number of schools needed to get back the automatic bid, are they going to even give them the bid back? Is it going to be a situation like with football with the bid for the playoffs? Oh, let me be quiet because they don't want to go to playoff football. Let me be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty unique circumstance with football is concerned. But, like, yeah, like having to, like, apply for, like, the automatic bid every year, mm-hmm. that does, like, your, your league no no favors, man, because, like, we talked about Alabama State and get and getting seated to play Tennessee, number one team in the country. Well, the mean school schools gonna get the same fate too. So they be like, well, it's, it's, it's a league with four teams in it, and we don't think they des- even deserve to be in tournament to begin with. So they got a platform on that bid. They're gonna get shafted too when, when, right. when it comes and, to tournament and, time. And I know people always say, well, you can't compare HBCUs to to the the, the PWIs, but it has already been a precedent. In the NCAA, where a team has received the automatic bid to the tournament without being in a comp with by being an independent, mm-hmm. the precedent has already been set. Now, I'm not gonna go out here and jump on a limb and say, Well, you know, depending on how me at school does, they may potentially get an at large bid unless they just have an out outrageous dynamic season because we know the perception and how we're perceived in the eyes of you know voters in the ncaa committee you could probably have a 35 win meac team next year and they still won't get an opportunity because True. they might not have an automatic bid yeah because voters were going to say well you know like they had been tested in conference play they're only playing <laughs> playing uh against three other teams right mm-hmm. and they non-conference got to be really really strong so they got to be really really well in non-conference have some have some quality wins there too. Quality wins, they gotta have some phenomenal wins outside of oh, like you, you gotta have they you gotta go over there and beat some you gotta beat the Eastern Carolina, you gotta beat a, a College of Charleston, you gotta, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You gotta beat the 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 big south schools over there, mm-hmm. the CIA schools, like play them. That's that that's like you're gonna have to play them. You're gonna have to. Like, if you're really trying to build your schedule, you know, to get that opportunity to get into the tournament. Like, I really hate that for the MEAC, that they only have four baseball schools. Like, I do, man. Like, that's that's opportunities that kids are missing out on not having an opportunity to play baseball in college. I don't care that it's not an mm-hmm. HBCU. It's just the opportunity that some kid is not having an opportunity. That it's an opportunity lost. So you said it's eight teams. They they the elite eight, but you know they only have four teams playing baseball. So if you look at that's a hundred and sixty young men. Mm-hmm. That's a hundred and sixty young men that don't have an opportunity to play baseball. You get what I'm saying? That's what 12, 12 coaches without a job. Yeah. I was just thinking like they the me at least the uh 
the, the ADs, they voted to include Chicago State into the conference, which has a baseball team. Mm -hmm. um, but the president's, you know, kind of shot that down. Um, so, yeah, like they at least thought about expanding the conference out of, out of necessity. I don't know how much Chicago State would have helped their baseball outlook because Chicago State um, doesn't have a really good baseball team. But, but, like, yeah, like they need to do something to, like, expand the league and like enhance the conference and like because you gotta attract you gotta think about this from a recruiting standpoint too like if you only have like four teams in your conference that's limited opportunities for scholarship for the league like you, you're not going to get the quality players you want um and some guys you, you may, may target may say well you know like why would i want to play on league with just like three other teams in it and and a non-conference schedule that doesn't include like the teams that doing cooking plays for example so it's 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 a really going to be an uphill battle for the league unless they make some drastic changes right away. I agree, man. I told you, and it's it's like again, I I, I don't think Hampton played baseball, but you had North Carolina and T lead the conference, a good baseball program when they were at least from what I know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I had the opportunity to coach against them when we played against them at Jack State, they were a good team. They had a different coach then as well, too. Um, then you have basically Bam, Bethune, Hampton, and Southern. I mean, it's not Southern. And you have um, – South Carolina State. No, South Carolina State still there. They don't play baseball, though. Oh, yeah. North Carolina, North Carolina Central, they dropped baseball. Yeah, they dropped baseball. Yeah, I was last baseball. year. Um, what, Hampton, Fam, Bethune, and a and you, you lose four schools, and mm -hmm. then you have other schools that drop baseball. So, mm -hmm. the MEAC has a rich baseball tradition. It has a very rich baseball tradition, just as rich as the Swags. But it's like the, the league has done nothing to preserve that baseball history. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, like I, for the 50th anniversary that they had for the league, they had a 50th anniversary team, and the the record keeping for the MEAC is impeccable. Like they have a legitimate record book for the single season records and career records. Can't say the same for the SWAC. I can't tell you none of the individual or single season records for the SWAC. I've never seen them compiled in my life. So Anybody the swag office or somebody that's watching this, if you've ever seen that, I'd like to see it myself. You know, I've never seen it. Um, the only thing you ever see is a list of the swag champions, but you we don't know who has the, the single season um batting average record in the swag. We don't know who has the single season RBI record, like you don't know. But I bet you let me, let me stop. Shut up, rap. <laughs> Your lady like stats and be like that boy good. <laughs> right, all you have like right now, if you probably went back to try to find what were the stats for X Y Z baseball player in nineteen eighty three in the sweat, you can't find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it goes back to our earlier conversations, like the beginning of the season and, and much throughout the season, like the investment schools have in the sport itself. Like we talk about this all the time, like them updating statistics online on the website schools not doing a very good job of like updating scores on social media let you know who the players are and the coaches are like they do for other sports it go it go, all goes back to that too it goes from the top down like so we, we see like one conference has four teams in it and there really isn't an urgency at least from outside looking in to try to improve on that and for a conference that, like, like, like we all said, like has a really rich tradition of baseball and good quality baseball too, but like some defections in like other leagues, schools dropping the sport, kind of just ravaged the conference. And so, like, how do you as a conference leader try to rectify that? I mean, because at the end of the day, like the kids are being hurt. Like they they're not playing against the best competition. Um, they're having to be extended necessarily a lot of times by playing these double headers every week um which endangers their current career and poss possibly future career too in the game wow. so it's, it's it's not a very good outlook for the MIAC right now yeah in any sense of the word I, yeah yeah and you know the scout report 
the scouting reports are intense. You playing a kid about what almost eight to twelve times in one year. That that to be honest, I hate to say it, but the Miak almost looks like a, a summer ball league. Like when kids come exactly, play one yeah. year, you know, and say, Okay, you know, I I'm playing college baseball. Let me see if I go somewhere else though. Because they don't that one season, they figured that everything, oh, you can't hit the outside pitch, you can't hit off speed. Oh, year two and year three, bro, if you don't make some adjustments and try to get better, you are going to be in – it's going to be a hard three years for you. Bro, honestly, I think with the way with the way sports are now, I don't even think mm-hmm. you get into three years. I think you get one season to make an adjustment. You don't show the adjustments. All right, that's fine. You somewhere else to go. Exactly. It's true. Like, I, I, I hate to say it like that, but I think now – the microwave effect of society has now hit athletics. Yeah. To work, you know, being honest, anybody that knows anything about developing a team or program and building a quality team, it takes time. Mm-hmm. Because you have to build chemistry. You have to develop the players. Like, it, the, the, the oh, I'm going to recruit this group of kids and we're going to have the, the Joe Burrow LSU effect, and we're going to win the Natty, or we're going to win the conference this year. That ain't that, that what that happened in that. That was an outlier. That was not mm-hmm. the norm. Mm-hmm. That wasn't the norm. That's an outlier. Mm-hmm. So you have to actually build your program. That's why for so many years, and I know I'm going to lose some people with this one. If you go back and look at how Skip Berkman built LSU. Skip Berman won that LSU for a long time, fellas, before he retired. If he was there 20 mm-hmm. years, I'd be surprised. Right? Mm-hmm. In that short amount of time, he won five national championships. Think about it. They won five national championships. But it took him time to get there. It took him time. He had to build the program. He built it from basically it, it wasn't LSU. We the LSU we know now is what he built, but it wasn't mm-hmm. that then. But it takes time. The same way if you look at the tradition of Southern Grambling and Jackson State, they didn't just become that in baseball overnight. It's years and it's and it's years of, of it transitioning from one coach having a successful program to another coach being successful, to another coach being successful. No no shade, but if you've been real honest about it, a lot of the programs in the SWAC, a lot of those coaches were there for 10, 10, 20 years, and they have records where they're almost 400, 500 games under 500. Mm -hmm. So is that really building a program? That's That's being content right there. They ain't building mm-hmm. nothing to be content the way you it's are. Taking a, it's taking a seat in a check. That's what that is. <laughs> yeah. That's like no direction. It's like, hey, like it's baseball season. Let's go, let's go get them. And then uh, that's it. Pretty you're much. a gambler. So they're gonna roll the yeah. dice every year. But yeah. yeah, but going back to Ralph's point about Skip Berkman, um, he wasn't he was at LSU starting in 84. His last year was 2001. Like you said, he won uh, five championships there. But it wasn't easy. Like, his first season was 12-12 and 12 in the conference. <laughs> so, it's going to take time. But, like, that's where, like, you got to have, like, athletic directors, support systems at the school to, like, know, like, to help the coach and the program, like, build, continue to invest in it over time. That way you have some some um, sustainability with, with within your program, like a uh, – and a lot and a lot of schools, because they don't care that much about baseball, they say, well, you know, like we have to have this number of sports because, you know, for our numbers or whatnot. So like as long as we got baseball out there, like we're gonna play the game and don't really don't care about winning and losing. Like if you really care about winning and losing, like you're gonna like try to build a program. And it's, it's gonna take some time to build a program. It ain't gonna take two years, like it's gonna take like four or five years to get where you really wanna go. If you really want to do it the right way, so that's what a lot of people got to keep in mind with that, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, I hope the coach at Alcorn um, 
I hope he gets the opportunity to build this program. You know, I hope he really gets the chance to. Um, because you got to think about it. He came in after a COVID season. No telling what happened with the recruits that were there mm-hmm. um, during that COVID season. No telling if they transferred out. You know, how many guys stayed. You don't know what the scholarship situation is down there. You don't really know what the – you know, you don't know. So, hopefully, what we saw this year with that, that's not the norm. Hopefully, some things can get going. Um, But, man, you know, like, the schools – and I know we always come back to this, and it always seems like we playing, we've been playing the same broken record for the last 20 years. But, like, the schools got to do better with – investing in baseball like no shade at the other sports but on some of these campuses the baseball team has been the most consistent program on the campus Mm -hmm. but everybody go chase the football team but that's society everybody follow football you know I just want baseball to get that same appreciation, man, because you got – it's no way. If anybody saw how any of those regional um, – the regional and super regional crowds look, if anybody saw what the, the women's college wear series look like, mm-hmm. the, you ain't going to sit here and tell me that these schools in the NCAA ain't making money off baseball. You can miss me with the non-revenue generating sport. Yeah. That's going to be the argument, though, Ralph. You can miss me with that. Mm. Miss me with that. Miss me with that. As, as I told you a couple weeks back, um, Ralph, like the best atmosphere college game I've ever been to was the Women's College World Series, Oklahoma City. Like electric all week, the all week at a tournament. I mean, like Oklahoma wins it every year, but still, like the people who come to that who come to that tournament, they're very passionate. The, the players are into it, the coaches are into it, the community like embraces it. And they're just like for a week in, in June. I mean, like, just imagine like if if we put that same or similar type of energy into like college baseball, like the atmosphere this weekend with the regionals, with the, with the super regionals, like you saw like fans in the game from the first pitch to the last pitch. There was something on the line for sure, but like, that energy, it's hard to duplicate in other sports because, like, it is, is it not as intimate as like baseball is, like much smaller crowd, people on top of you, um, you can hear everything uh, from the stands. But like, yeah, like that's the got to be the goal. Like these programs want to be, and like it's a shame that like a lot of times, like people within our game don't don't really see it that way. You want to know why? And I'm gonna be honest, because they don't have baseball people in the position. You got to have baseball people in the decision making process. I, I'm just because a person has a business degree, don't mean they understand how to run baseball business. You get what I'm saying? They don't. It's 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 certain things with every sport. Like I just believe baseball people. You have the swag. You have coach. Coach Will Ellis is still. Coach Cato or Coach Brady, you got Coach Johnson, you got Coach Hernandez, Coach Crenshaw, Coach Rock. You got baseball people. You don't, you wouldn't think that like conference with the coach to say, hey, what should we possibly do, you know, in certain situations? What would y'all like to see? Or maybe the swag mm-hmm. does do that. I don't know. Now I've been making some inroads, like having these uh, beginning of the season games and like major league ballparks, you know. Um, like the FAMU Grambling uh, uh, Jackson State tournament to start the season, they they can see that vision in terms of like get more exposure. But like it's got to be a trickle down effect throughout the entire conference um, mm-hmm. for that to happen. Um, we got the HBCU baseball All Star game we talked about last week. Um, we got the HBCU uh, World Series. So there are things in place to get more exposure, but like. This got to be like a, a continuum throughout the season. Like, just can't be like these one special events, like at certain points in the season. It's got to be like sustainability throughout it. Mm. Sure. One thing would be good. I was just thinking this off the top of my head, man. You know how we had that MLB invitation to Andrew Dawson? 
They all are just making an MLB weekend where all the schools they play they play each other at the major league ballparks. They ain't got to travel. Ain't nothing going on. It's already beginning the season. The, the pro teams are still down in Florida for spring training. So here you have ballpark that's open, and you can almost also tip your hat to the programs and just kind of you know bring them in, have have the have the schools up in, in Baltimore and all that. Go play at you know Oriole Stadium or go play Yankee Stadium or something like that, or you know like down here down in Texas. Let them go play Minute Maid Park, you know, for the opening week of uh of the season that that actually would be a, a good opportunity for for the programs to get exposure and on and i mean may i don't know how much revenue it probably bring in tv time or something like that but it would be good to get that partnership going going together uh, i like the andrew dawson classic it was pretty interesting but i think they could expand on it and start having it major league ballparks because ain't nothing really going on my my biggest concern I don't really care if they play it at a major league ballpark. I would rather them play it at a facility where it would draw in a location that would draw more HBCU baseball fans. Fans, yeah. True. Like that and that's my deal. Like, yeah, like, the they played, is, mm-hmm. like they played at Wesley Barrow last year. To me, I think that's ideal. It need it, it doesn't need to be in a huge stadium. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, you want to say, yeah, our guys played in a minor league double-A stadium, but I don't have no problem with that. But let's make sure, you know, if we're going to put them into something, we can do it on campus. A lot of these schools had the, the facility on campus to do it. Do it. If conference, if conference USA can have their conference tournament rotated through schools. Yeah. Yeah, we might as well do it through schools. That's true. I'm just saying, it's just a different idea, man. Mm. Uh, even I say, man, just have it on TV. Have Yo, all the games on TV on MLB Network, bro. I'm so irritated. See, I'm irritated with this sweat con- with the the TV contract because basically the ESPN got all the rights, man. If I understand this correct, so that's why they can just come not show no baseball game all year. Don't stream nothing on the ESPN, ESPN Ocho, Nueve, Diaz, none of that. And then you just come back and say, "Oh, we're gonna stream the game on ESPN three for the championship game." Like didn't show any other game, but came at the end of the mm-hmm. show them because they had a, the contract, the rights to do it. Mm-hmm. I. Mm. I mean, you'll see a swag game on ESPN, but it'll be uh, we'll the be the SEC system. network, the SEC network, or something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, but not like exclusive to like one of the ESPN tiers outside of the streaming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and a, and a lot of the investment, like in in baseball, is like it's like out of sight of the mind too. Like we don't see you on TV, we don't see you like in the news online. Like people ain't gonna know you're around. And want to mm-hmm. and want to come to the games and want to invest in you. So that's another thing schools got and conferences got to get better at, like putting your product out there in the public. I mean, like as much as we talk about like football and other sports, how they become a kind of commodities. Like you see now what happened with Deion Sanders at State. Like his name is out there all the time in in the media. Like what he some what he says, what he does, and people say about him too. Like that's. That's free advertisement. That's that's, that's that's marketing your program, marketing uh, football. Like a similar strategy could be instituted with baseball, even though the fact that like no school has a, has a baseball coach with the personality and the following of Deion Sanders. But like, if we can get a group of coaches with 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 the same type of initiative to like be more visible and be more vocal, it will at least get attention to people. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, ain't, I ain't got nothing else tonight, though. I'm all talked out. Uh, thinking of that, man, y'all ever think we'll see the day where we see a Major League Baseball legend come back and coach baseball at HBCU? Like a Ken mm-hmm. Griffey or, or, or anybody. They don't, a, they don't have a connection. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I was thinking too. They don't have a connection. They don't have a tie. 
I mean, like the closest we've ever gotten to that in college baseball was Tony Gwynn yeah, going exactly. to coach uh, at, at, San, at San Diego State. Okay, yeah. I know Darren Erstad is at Nebraska right now, but like it's very rare that, well, uh, Oklahoma State has Robert Ventura, who is yeah. an actual college baseball legend. Mm-hmm. He's an assistant at Oklahoma State. But like, other than that, like it's just very, very rare for like an ex major leaguer to go to the college game. Like, if they're going into coaching, they're going to the pro game, they ain't going to the college game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. That's true. Mm-hmm. But I think a few years ago, Alabama State was in the running to hire Jerry Manuel, former uh, big league manager with the White Sox, a few mm-hmm. years ago. He's still he's still around the college baseball game himself, um, running camps and stuff like that. But like, you know, like it, it, it's gonna be real hard to get a Hall of Fame baseball player to <laughs> to come across the swing of the or, or Division Two. Mm-hmm. I think that Dion is fit to trickle over the baseball. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I don't think Honestly, so. mm-hmm. I can see a Brandon Phillips type. Mm-hmm. Like a, I think it. Like I think honestly, I think Brandon Phillips could probably have like the personality to kind of like be a HBCU baseball coach. Mm-hmm. Just from just seeing him um, as he played throughout his career. He just seemed mm-hmm. like he had just that kind of swag yeah. about it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I was thinking maybe Tory Hunter too. Yeah. Tory Hunter, he, yeah. He's from Pine Bluff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he could he could possibly step into their role, um, coaching a bike college baseball team. But I was thinking like you see a lot of ex football players, uh, NFL guys wanting to coach the HBCUs. You don't really hear about the, the same thing with like black college baseball. I mean. Tory Hunter's a guy we mentioned. The Brandon Phillips, Ralph said. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. It's it's going to be hard to convince them. I guess like once you get out the game, man, like they just want to like sit back and retire and just yeah. do their thing, pretty much run their camps or whatever. But mm-hmm. yeah, fellas, um, good show tonight. A lot of really good discussion. Um, a, a lot of really good um, talk about not just the current game, but like what we see it going in the future. Hopefully, it'll be in a better place than as it is now. Looking forward to uh, listening to Ralph's interview with uh, an- another uh, Black Eyes baseball recruit that's dropping tomorrow on our YouTube channel. We say one o'clock tomorrow, Ralph. This is well for if you're watching this now, it should be about about two o five. So the JoJo Smiley interview is going to be at 6 p.m. tonight. 6 p.m. tonight. Tune in. 6 p.m. tonight. 6 p.m. tonight. This, this episode premiered at 1 p.m. Yep. We're speaking from the future. So. Yes. So if you're watching this now, you should be, it should be about 2.05 on Thursday, <laughs> June 16th. So the interview it will be at tonight <laughs> at 6 p.m. on our YouTube, and it'll actually be on Spotify early in the day. Uh, Why you sound like Cody what? Bellinger, man? I don't know. Say what? Why you sound like Cody Bellinger? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll tell y'all a lot of picks tomorrow. Yeah, I need to go find the great sports almanac. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Run that thing back like Michael J. Fox, man. Hey, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna lie to you though. If I ever could go back in time and put money on a bet, I would go back and tell my daddy when Mike Tyson fought Busted Ugly, tell both mm-hmm. my parents go put both of y'all whole check on Tyson to get knocked out. I bet both of them will look at me and be like, "Boy, get out of here." <laughs> Hey, go put get all the money at the bank. Everybody, put all your money together, and we're gonna put it on my on dude to knock Tyson out. It's gonna be one person that's gonna listen to me. Everybody gonna be like, "Boy, get out of here." Mm-hmm. That's I'm fine, crazy. man. That's I'm from the future. I've seen it already. <laughs> the boy crazy. Somebody pray for the boy. That's funny. I think the same thing about it. if you go put if you would have put your money on the Braves a year ago. 
You put your money on no. the Braves after, after the uh, All Star break, man. Around July, if you, I think it was like a hundred dollars. You put a hundred dollars that they go win the World Series, bro. You probably would have came out of that thing with a, a hundred and fifty, <laughs> two hundred thousand, <laughs> cause the odds were bad. Terrible. Yeah, you put them, they pulled them Yankee moves, man. They went out and bought them some guys. <laughs> but yeah, man, they ain't mad at. Them. They ain't mad at them Next week we'll be back. Same bat time, same bat channel. Peace. Peace. And they say peace in the middle. East. Nah, but last thing, I don't know if y'all remember this, but it, our generation might have been the last generation where they did advertisement for the cigarettes. Oh, yeah. They did. I know y'all yeah. seen somebody that used to have them neon glasses, the neon Newport glasses when we were kids. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they also they granddad. Somebody went bought them a card in the Newport and got them glasses. And you walk around there yeah, with neon Newport glasses on. Just chilling. Like nothing with the sun. Boy, Boy, oh. nah. They got you some uh-uh. Newport glasses. You don't know nothing about no poison. No new poison. You just know that's the box they got in the freezer at the house. Freezer. They told you don't touch it. Exactly. <laughs> What made them take uh, the cigarettes to keep them fresh? <laughs> <laughs> Go grab me a show. He's silly, bro. Ruffles pantomime and you're smoking a cigarette. Exactly. Go on that boy. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, smoke that smoke be burning that burning that eye. They should have boy going on back. Going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, all right. I'm gonna tell y'all then then we going. My okay. grandfather smoked non-filtered cigarettes, right? Yeah. Cold blooded. My dumb butt one time was like, yo, I'm gonna I'm gonna get the butt, I'm gonna get the shout at the at the um the cigarette at the dog on ashtray and when i go with my auntie out we're gonna smoke the shop i moved on <laughs> ain't bro i promise you i don't smoke cigarettes to this day because of that one experience speaking of tobacco products man dip what about it oh. i don't do it as a kid Huh? Man. Don't do it as a kid, man. I tried to do it one time, man. Ooh. Talk about bubble guts. Hey, boy. Mm-hmm. That thing, boy. Yeah. Boy, I'm telling you. Be sitting there practice stretching. Mm-hmm. Boy, whole jaw be sitting up like that. <laughs> I think my little kid got the deal pocket on it. Yep. You start feeling woozy. That's when it kick in. Hey, I'm talking about, boy. Now, I ain't like dipping on the bus, but at mm. practice, oh, I dropped me one in at practice. Boy, be stretching, be sitting out there stretching, be sitting out there looking. Hey, I see yellow stars, green horseshoes, <laughs> yellow clothes. <laughs> Lucky times. <laughs> and that was and that was leaving college baseball for a long, long time. It was never legal. It was just a part of the game. Yeah. Like, you would see umpires dipping. Mm-hmm. Like the umpire would have a chew in. The only thing was, don't have a can in your pocket on the field. Okay, yeah. Like that was fact. Then they start cracking down on a little bit more. But honestly, I think after Tony Gwynn had the council yeah. with the tobacco, that changed a lot. Yeah, it did. You no, know, I don't even think now. I don't nearly see as many guys dipping as when we was in school. But dipping was like, I know dudes that only dipped on the baseball field. Mm-hmm. And like, would not touch a dip off the field, but then you had some other dudes that 24 7. I'm talking about you riding in the car, they <laughs> like, bro, you mm-hmm. got a sweet can in my car. Mm-hmm. It's the Tony. filthiest thing on earth is a dip spit can, huh? Man, the filthiest thing on earth is a dip spit can. Yeah, that's worse than an ashtray. Yeah, <sighs> that's worse than a toilet, for Christ's sake. I don't think worse. I don't think that worse. Oh, oh, that, oh, hey, that that spit can though, boy. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, yeah, my stomach hurt. Think about that. <laughs> <laughs> what you telling me? And if you play, a, if you ever played a prank on somebody with some with a dip can with the dip can mm-hmm. juice, you deserve to be beat. You de- yeah, you do. That was grounds for like. Beat. That was no. grounds to get knocked out, man. That was no. grounds to get knocked out. Uh, you, you deserve more than just a knockout, boy. That's nasty, man. That is nasty, man. Yeah, that's that's super nasty, bro. That's nasty. I, I never play a prank on nobody with a dip can. I don't, I don't bring that dip can by me. Hmm. Oh, man. <laughs> oh. It's a visual, man. Just the smell. The smell. All right, man. All right. we done, Slim. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be yeah. back yeah. next week, people. We'll have Arrington Easton on Gramlin State Commit. We're gonna have another topic for you. I'm gonna reach out to I'm I'm I need to reach out to a very a very um insightful individual on the on the um the topic of economics with HBCU so that way we could you know understand that we just sitting here wasting our time talking. And see how we can really change the dynamic, and if these schools can really do that with all the sports, and how to make the sports a business, because that's what they really are. It's a business. Yes, we're gonna learn something. Yeah. So about something. Same as I said earlier, before we start talking about dip can, same back time, same back channel. We the boys. We the boys on the hill. Oh yeah! Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Stay hydrated as you cook your own meal on the grill. <laughs> you know. Shout out to the man that do it. Yeah, you know. Take your sons and daughters to a baseball game this weekend. No, nah, let your let your family take you to a baseball game. To a baseball right? game. And, and if you yeah. go to you go to um Truist Park out there in, in uh, Marietta, take you by seventeen hundred thousand dollars because you're gonna need it. Yep. You know, <laughs> you're gonna need it. Or you can go to a minor league baseball game for far cheaper. It's better you atmosphere. Can. You can go to Lawrenceville, the yeah. Cool Ray Field. Ain't they the yeah. Snappers or something out there? Uh, the Stingers or something. Whatever it is. I ain't a Braves fan, so I don't yeah. care. I'm not a, a fan yeah. of no Atlanta sport. If you got a wood bat <laughs> league in your area, take take your kids to there. See some college baseball players. Y'all saw. Yeah. Yeah. See the stars for tomorrow. But. We are out of here, but yeah, fathers, happy Father's Day to you, happy Father's Day to my pops, happy Father's Day, happy Father's Day to all my uncles, happy Father's Day to you, watch all my Jackson State brothers, Father, yeah. all the fathers that's out there in the HBCU baseball fraternity, you know, happy Father's Day to y'all, man, much love to you. Father, we like long snappers on the team, don't nobody know we, don't even know we there until we mess up. Exactly, until we mess up. But hey. I wouldn't have it no in no other way. Cause I'm sure gonna cook my own meal Sunday. <laughs> cook my own ribs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, man. I'm gone. All right, man. All right. All right. All right.